so uh, I did get interested in, in Lego because, um, you know, what I study is how uh, to help companies become more consistently, reliably innovative. Um, and I was going to do a typical business book about my ideas about that, you know, wh where you have every chapter is a piece of the framework and one or two stories from companies, and then it all builds to the thrilling conclusion at the end where you show the, the, the whole framework. And it's really kind of a, a tired format. Um, I, I went into Lego to try and get their story. And what I saw there was a company that had really put in place an innovation management system that was uh, pretty much everything that I thought a company should do. Um, and it was accompanied by this story of uh, also a company that had almost gone out of business because of the way they managed innovation. In 2003, they were this close to bankruptcy because they'd kind of over-innovated. Um, and what they have done since then is, is uh, truly impressive, and what I want to do is tell you this story. Um, I have just finished this book. It uh, comes out next month. Um, I should warn you that uh, you know, I've been spending five years of my life studying Lego, so I have a hard time talking about this in less than six hours. So I, I hope you're comfy. So I, I, I just thought I'd also um, show some of my favorite Lego creations. It's kind of fun to reconnect with the brand. I mean, I think you're all familiar with the brick and the, some of these uh, uh, iconic toys that Lego has brought to market. Um, I also love uh, so the, what some of the fans have done. And Eric talked about uh, this guy, Adam Reed Tucker, who was an architect, and he wanted to illustrate to kids um, how buildings really work, how structures work. And so he started creating these three-meter-tall uh, replicas of famous architectural landmarks, um, which later became the Lego architecture line. Or um, this uh, uh, recreation of Obama's inauguration uh, that was done in a Legoland with uh, incredible detail of um, the, the, uh, the inauguration itself. You can see in the, in the lower left there, uh, Obama actually accepting the oath of office. And in the lower right, uh, you can see uh, George uh, Bush Sr. has fallen asleep while, <laughs> while George W. is checking his watch to see when the event is going to be over. And that's Aretha Franklin singing at the top right. Um, or James May in the UK built a two-story house out of Lego with working toilets. Uh, it's just incredible. I, I thought I'd put this in for you, Jay. Uh, so a, a, uh, somebody used the robotics kit to make an, an amazing uh, version of WALL-E. Um, and so this is the robotics kit that, uh, that was developed by fans, and the fans continue to push the capabilities of the, of the toy. So you're probably aware of, of uh, at least some of these creations. What you may not be aware of, though, is the story behind it. Um, and this is really the story in one slide. Uh, this is Lego's sales for their entire history. Uh, the company was started in 1932. It grew very slowly. Um, the, the brick as we know it was patented in 1958. Uh, in 1977, 78, uh, the grandson of the founder took over and they went through this uh, wonderful growth path. Um, they hit a stagnant period in the mid-90s and the founder stepped away and brought in an outside turnaround expert. That person um, said, we need to innovate. And he started innovating. And they hit new peaks in terms of sales um, but, and it all worked until it didn't. And then in 2003 and 2004, the company was very close to uh, bankruptcy and having to liquidate or sell themselves off to another company. But over the next couple of years, um, they put in a new system of managing innovation between 2003 and 2007. The new management team uh, came in and, and really changed the way they managed innovation. And once that kicked in in 2007, um, their five-year average annual growth rate in sales is 24%. That's what you see in this graph. They've been growing at 24% per year on average for the last five years. Um, but that's the slower rate. The profit growth has been 40% per year for the last five years. So they're, they're doing something right. And uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll talk about that. And, and what's amazing is that this growth spurt starts right when the financial downturn happened, right? 2008 affected toy companies like it affected all your companies. Um, it didn't affect Lego, though. What, what is interesting, though, what I find interesting about Lego um, is that if I was to ask you yesterday, you know, to name a company in a viciously competitive global industry that has fickle customers and, and rapidly changing customer needs so that you have to renew your product line every year or two, 
um, but who is dominating their industry because of their ability to innovate? You'd probably say Apple, right? Or, or, or a company like, or Google, something like that. Um, what's interesting is that I've looked at all the lists of the most innovative companies, um, and there's five of them that I've been able to find. Lego doesn't make the top 10, the top 20, the top 50 of any list that I could find. It's this great untold story. And, you know, the only, uh, the only example that Eric could, th could find of an award for uh, most innovative company was this kind of small, you know, most innovative in Bill in Denmark type of award. And, and so I think it's this great untold story that I will tell you today. And focusing mostly on this uh, period of innovation that almost killed them and then what they did to turn it around. And hopefully you can get some ideas that you can bring back to your company. What I find interesting about it is that um, I have been both a consultant and I'm currently a, a management academic. And we've been telling companies for uh, you know, 15, 20 years how to manage innovation. And there's lots of these, these truths about innovation. Um, we've, we've heard Eric talk about open innovation, how important that is. Um, but there's others. Explore the full spectrum of innovation. Practice disruptive innovation. Find blue ocean markets. Um, all these other things that we, we have been telling um, um, executives uh, that they should do, um, and we're still telling them. Um, you come to Wharton for an executive program, these are the kinds of things we talk about. What's interesting is that Lego tried all these things, and they almost went bankrupt. And so let me give you just a a quick uh, um, uh, refresher course on the management of innovation. Um, the first is the full spectrum of innovation, that innovation is more than um, just, uh, just products, that there's lots of different types of innovation. When Apple brought out the iPod in 2001, it was a nice device, but if that's all they'd brought out, would they be as dominant in music uh, today as they are? Um, you know, it's because they brought out a number of other innovations. Um, it, it was the first uh, device that was genuinely portable that had a hard disk inside, and they locked up the supply of that hard disk for 18 months so nobody else could put it in a, in a portable music player. Um, they had uh, a 100-page catalog of docks and skins and chargers and other complementary products that, that enhanced the ownership experience. And, of course, iTunes with its fair play copy protection system, which was the first one that kind of got it right, you know, in terms of the balance between protecting the intellectual property of the music companies and also being easy enough that most people could use it without any trouble. Um, and almost all the music companies connected in. They were selling uh, by the song, so you didn't have to buy the whole CD. Uh, there was lots of innovations in that. Of course, there's a very compelling branding campaign, and then later the Apple stores as a way to, um, to, to show and a, a very different customer experience. My favorite story about the Apple stores was a, a story in Vanity Fair magazine in the U.S. a couple years ago. They had uh, an article about the best place to meet men in New York City. And, and so it's compelling on many different dimensions. But, but we should be looking at all the different ways that we can innovate um, because it's much more powerful to do many together. Um, disruptive innovation is the idea that um, new technologies often start at the low end and they have lower quality and lower cost than existing technologies. But the rate of change of technology is much faster than the rate of change of customer needs. And so, for example, in the steel industry, um, steel in the 70s and 80s and before was made through a very traditional process of, of blast furnaces. Um, and the integrated steel makers dominated the industry. Well, Around the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, there was a new technology that came in online, which was electric arc furnaces. You take scrap metal, you put it in a big bucket, and you put three electrodes in, and you make steel that way. And at first, it could only make the very lowest quality steel, rebar, um, which you use to reinforce concrete roads and bridges and things like that. But the rate of change of the capabilities of the technology was much faster than the rate of change of customer needs. And so uh, the capabilities of electric arc furnaces got to be better and better. And at every stage, they were cheaper um, than the integrated manufacturers. And they drove the, the um, traditional steelmakers out of business. And the same thing has happened in disk drives. Uh, Clayton Christensen, the Harvard Business School professor who pioneered this with the innovator's dilemma, um, he talks about disk drives and how at every stage the leader in one technology was left behind in the next, te next technology. We're going to hear later today from somebody from Kodak. Kodak was a leader in digital photography, but got left behind, I'm sorry, yeah, was, knew more about digital photography, but got left behind because the profits on the, on the film uh, were so incredible that they were able to squash any effort to bring digital cameras to market. 
And then lastly, this uh, 3D printer that you probably all heard about. Um, these things that can print 3D shapes uh, very quickly in your basement um, are changing the way some types of manufacturing are being done. My favorite example of 3D printers is this one. Uh, there was an artist that uh, used a very cheap uh, iPhone scanner, scanned his girlfriend's face, cut out the lips, grafted them onto a coffee cup lid so that every time he drinks coffee, it's like he's kissing his girlfriend. <laughs> Which is kind of sweet, kind of creepy, but you know, it's, it's something that you couldn't do through any other technology. Um, Blue ocean market, sale for blue ocean markets. The metaphor here is that red oceans are red because there's blood in the water, the sharks are circling, the competition is intense and vicious. Um, and that what we should do is we should find underserved markets um, and find a way to give them something that, they, that nobody else in the market is giving them and find a blue ocean that we can sail towards. Um, ING Direct, uh, a bank that was started in Canada and then went to Australia, France and, and uh, the US, Spain and Italy, the UK, um, came in with the whole concept of uh, we are your other bank. You know, you all have accounts, debit or credit, credit or, or um, uh, um, checking accounts in the US that you use to pay your monthly bills. ING Direct says, keep that account. We want to be your other bank. Uh, we don't have branches, we don't have ATMs. Um, if you call up ING Direct and ask a question, they'll answer the phone. If you keep calling, they'll put you at the back of the queue and make you wait longer. And if you keep calling, they'll fire you. They'll send you your money back. They, they say, we don't want a relationship with you. We just want you to send us your money and leave us alone. You know, we want to be the low-cost banking alternative. The, their cost structure is one-sixth of a traditional bank because they have very few products, very simple products, but they are the fastest-growing bank in history. Um, because they found an underserved market of affluent savers that just wanted a place to put a couple thousand dollars um, in case they needed it for a, a, an emergency. So um, other examples, Dell changed the way we think about and buy computers. Um, Southwest Airlines and EasyJet and Ryanair um, changed the whole air airline industry. Um, uh, Quicken for financial software. Before Quicken, financial software was very full-featured and, and difficult to use. Uh, Quicken make it very easy to use. And so these are all these, the, the, the other ones, um, uh, hire diverse and creative people. Um, that we, we shouldn't hire people that are all like ourselves. So we'll get different ideas for different types of people. Um, walk in your customer's shoes. You know, practice customer-centric design or design thinking, if you're familiar with those terms, um, uh, so that we can get uh, closer to our customers. And build an innovation culture, you know, something where we value creativity and innovation. Um, these are all things that we've been saying for decades and are still telling people, and Lego did all these things and almost went bankrupt. So let me, let me give you just a few minutes on the history of the company because it's, it's relevant to how they got themselves in trouble. And then I'll talk some about um, what they did to turn themselves around. So Lego was founded in 1932. Um, it was founded by a carpenter. Uh, soon after the company started, uh, his wife died, leaving him to raise his four boys by himself. Um, he uh, made wooden toys at first. He invested against the wishes of his son. Um, in 1947, he bought one of the first injection molding machines in Denmark and started making plastic toys. Uh, to Vreek's uh, presentation, uh, some of the responses that he got back from, um, from the, uh, the store owners were, you know, plastic toys will never replace wooden toys. You know, we've always had wooden toys, we always will have wooden toys. Um, and so they predicted his failure and sent his toys back. Um, his son took over in 1956. Um, they patented the brick as we know it in 1958. They grew very slowly over there, just making you know simple sets uh, about uh, towns and and uh, um, fire stations, hospitals, police cars, fire trucks, things like that. And then in 1977, the grandson of the founder, a guy named Kel Kirk Christensen, takes over, um, and he does a series of innovations that I think are amazing. Um, one of them is Duplo. Uh, Duplo had been around, kind of kicking around, but he really put some marketing effort and development effort behind it. And Duplo is bigger bricks for smaller hands for, for younger toddlers, you know, expanding the Lego universe outward toward younger kids that you wouldn't give the smaller bricks to for worry that they'd swallow them. That does very well. And then he thinks, well, we could go the other direction. Uh, kids tend to leave Lego around age 10 or 12. Why don't we make something 
uh, for them. And so he, he creates uh, this set hoping to draw teenagers in, um, which is technique. Um, and it is a set of motors and beams and, and axles and gears, and you can make very much more complicated and sophisticated things. Um, and he thinks we can attract teenagers with this. Uh, it fails almost completely with teenagers. But he does find a market of 25 to 45-year-old men that love it and continue to love it, and, and, do, uh, and so it continues to sell tremendously well. Um, the, uh, the biggest innovation, though, that I think uh, that Kel Kirk brought out was this was the minifigure. Because the minifigure, those, those of us who are, say, 45 years and, and older, um, we had a very different Lego play experience than those of you 40 and younger. Because we didn't have the minifigure. Um, we didn't have that ability to kind of personalize the play experience and immerse ourselves in it um, that younger kids have now. Um, and so he, he brought out this minifigure, which I think dramatically changed the play experience. He rescaled all the sets around it and brought out the first fantasy sets, these space and castle sets. Maybe you remember these. They were incredibly popular. Um, and so he brought these out, uh, and it ushered in this period of incredible growth. For the next 15 years, Lego grew at 14% per year every year for 15 years. They're basically doubling in size every five years for 15 years. They bring out more theme sets. There's Western, there's pirates, there's trains. Um, it expands globally, um, especially into North America, really um, enters North America more seriously. Um, and so it's this golden period in Lego's history. And then it kind of comes to a natural end. You know, there's only so many meters of shelf space in so many toy stores around the world and sales plateau in the mid-90s. And so they want to regain the growth of the company, and so what they do is they start bringing out more and more toys. You say, well, if, if uh, the ones we have aren't selling, and so they, they triple, I'm going to change the scales on you here, um, this is the number of new toys, they triple the number of new toys on the market over the course of between 93 and 98. And so what do you think happens to their costs? Right? Their costs go way up, their sales don't go anywhere, so their profits go way down. They suffer the first loss in company history. They lay off 1,000 people. The, the grandson of the founder, Kel Kirk, he steps aside and he says, maybe I'm not the right person to run this company. He brings in a turnaround expert, a guy named Paul Plowman, who turned around Bang & Olufsen, the iconic Danish uh, high-end uh, consumer electronics maker. And, uh, and Paul Plowman does what we would all recommend that he, he do. He goes out and he looks at the market. And what he finds is that the company has become a, a fairly insular company. Um, and those of you who have ever been to Billund uh, would see why. I mean, there's, there's three hours of nothing in every direction from Billund. Um, and, but he goes out and, and looks at the market. What he finds is that, you know, kids are, are leaving traditional toys, not just Lego, but Hot Wheels and, and Barbies and, and all the other traditional toys much younger and going to, um, you know, PlayStation and Xbox and so forth. Um, he finds that the retailers are becoming much more sophisticated. They know much more about what kids are buying and wanting than Lego does. Um, he finds that all of the other manufacturers of toys have outsourced production to China, um, and so their toys are getting cheaper. Meanwhile, in their biggest market, the U.S., um, the, the dollar is getting weaker against the kroner, the Danish kroner. And so Lego's toys are getting more expensive in the U.S., while the other toys are getting cheaper, kind of being hit double. Um, and all of the patents have expired on the Lego brick. Anybody can make a Lego brick to this day, and many do. There's half a dozen uh, companies out there making bricks that will snap together with Lego bricks. So this is kind of a recipe for a lousy industry to be in. And so he says, if we don't want to become a commodity, we have to innovate. And so he goes out and he does every single one of these seven truths. He, he starts with this new vision for innovation. We want the Lego brand to become the world's strongest brand among families with children by 2005. And internally, he's given a, a, a performance target to double sales between 2000 and 2005. And if he does, he'll get a huge bonus, be able to retire, choose his successor, etc. And he goes off and he does every single one of these. He starts hiring people. He opens up a, um, a, a new design studio in Italy. He acquires a, a maker of intelligent toys in California, um, puts people in uh, Spain and, and um, uh, in Japan. He uh, opens up a new media business in uh, the UK. He opens up the internet business in New York. You know, just realizing that you can't design toys for the world's kids from the middle of nowhere, Denmark. Um, 
he uh, looks for blue ocean in lots of different places. There's a Legoland amusement park in Billund that's been open since the 60s, um, but he realizes that that really is a blue ocean opportunity, that most amusement parks are targeted for teenagers. Legoland, for those of you who've been there, you know, is targeted toward a younger audience, and so it really is an underserved market, and so he opens up more of these in, uh, in California, in Germany, and the UK. Um, also looking for blue ocean, but also in a very open way, he uh, finds a partner um, in Asia and starts opening education centers. Um, Asian kids, Korea, Japan especially, will have anywhere from 10 to 15 after-school activities per week. And you can teach science and technology and engineering and math um, using Lego in some really interesting ways. So he partners with a company, opens up these education centers, finds this new market to sell Lego into. Um, also, in kind of the open theme, he partners with Steven Spielberg and creates this movie studio where you can use Lego creations and make movies out of them. He, um, uh, he does surveys, his team does surveys, and finds that actually three quarters of kids don't like construction toys. And so he creates this line of toys called Jack Stone where you can snap them together in a matter of minutes and start playing with them. You know, Lego for the, the rest of the, of the kids. Um, he uh, tries the, a full-spectrum approach with Galador. Galador is this toy that has this rich story behind it, um, and he creates a TV show together with Hollywood. Um, and uh, there's the toy itself uh, has electronics in it, so you can play games on the toy, but also the TV show has ultrasonic signals to the toy, and so if you watch the TV show with your toy, it'll talk back to the TV show. He commissions a game, uh, from uh, uh, Electronic Arts. And if you play the game with your toy, it'll talk back to the game. So kind of really thinking about all the different types of innovation that would make a toy more successful. Um, and uh, in, again, for Blue Ocean, he creates this line of electronic toys for toddlers, for the younger generation. This one here, you drag it behind, the, the toddler would drag it behind him, and it would play a different song depending on which little mushroom-shaped uh, uh, object you plugged into it. So by any dimension, oh, also disruptive innovation. He creates uh, something called Lego Factory, where you can actually build with Lego without any plastic bricks. It's a 3D computer-aided design environment that uses only Lego um, to build Lego creations. And so by any uh, measure, he becomes a very uh, a creative company. So spinning off one, one innovation after another. And like I said, it all worked until it didn't. 2003... They start hearing noises from the market. They get a young uh, ex-consultant, a guy named Jörn V. Nudstorp, um, who's their director of strategy, and they say, you know, go out and, and find out what's happening here. We're, he we're hearing some, some, that there might be some troubles in the market. And so he goes out, spends a couple months, talks to people, talks to, to um, uh, retailers, comes back in to the management meeting in June of 2003, and sitting there is Kjell Kirk Christensen, the, the grandson of the founder and still the one who controls the, family, uh, the family's fortune. This is still mostly a family-owned business, as well as the rest of the management team. And he says, we are on a burning platform. We're going to lose a billion Danish kroner this year and probably twice as much next year. We have no committed lines of credit. We're running out of cash. We probably won't make it. Further, he does a, a, an economic value analysis, for those of you who, who know this, um, it, an EVA. It, it, it's a simple concept. What you do is you say, if you had taken your money and instead of putting it into Lego, if you put it into risk-free Danish government bonds 10 years ago, what would you be worth today? And what he finds is that investing in Lego had destroyed the Christensen family fortune to the rate of $1.6 billion dollars. In other words, by leaving their money in Lego instead of risk-free Danish government bonds, they had been destroying the family fortune at the rate of half a million dollars a day, every day, for 10 years. And so the, the management board is shocked, you know, that, that this is happening. There's some argument back and forth. Um, they bring in an external CFO, a very respected guy named Jesper Oveson. He takes a look at the numbers in the books and says, if anything, Jeren V was a little bit too easy on you. It's even worse than that. Um, they decide to let, let go Paul Plowman, the turnaround expert. Um, they, uh, in the next year, 2004, they make Jürgen V the president. Uh, he's 30, 34 years old at the time, and he's got to turn around the company. And so here are the, some of the things that he did. I'll tell you the story kind of through a couple of toys. One of the things that happened with Lego is that as they innovated, 
they, the complexity of the company exploded. This is a graph, the, the, the number of, of different elements they have. An element is a shape and color combination. So a red brick is counted by Lego as a different element than a, a yellow brick. Uh, but you get the idea that the complexity just shot up over the course of this innovation period um, and actually hit a, a period in the middle there of over 14,000 different elements. Um, and as you can imagine, the cost shot up too. And there was a huge debate about whether you should cut the number of elements. As you can imagine, the manufacturing and supply chain people were saying, you know, this is killing us. We've got to cut this complexity down. Um, whereas the designers were saying, no, you know, what we need is sales and we need all these different shapes and colors to be able to make the, the toys that we want to make. Um, what swung it was they brought to a management meeting these, uh, the, these actual um, figures. And these are minifigures. At the top is uh, eight different policemen. There's three different bad guys. There's three of the, they actually found six different chefs. Um, and what they found was all that variety really didn't have any value. In fact, some of the designers were um, designing the faces to look like themselves. They were immortalizing themselves in Lego. Um, and so they, they did. They, they cut the, the, the number of pieces in half. And they said, you know what? Our designers really rediscovered what Lego was all about. Instead of being able to, you know, if you're designing a car, uh, you just make a new piece to do the car fender, you had to figure out how to use the more universally usable pieces and construct your own fender. Um, and that's really what Lego was all about, that creativity. Um, and uh, one of the things that they didn't expect, though, when they cut all these um, uh, pieces was the outcry from the fan community. Um, you know, Eric talked about how wonderful the input is, but these fans have very strong uh, um, uh, feelings about it. And when they killed off five of the chefs, some of the fans complained. I, I love that chef, and he's gone. And so they had a memorial service to the dead chefs. You know, <laughs> we love them too. You know. <laughs> and then Mads Nipper, a guy who heads up all of um, the product development and marketing um, efforts, he calls together in a, a series of meetings all 600 of the developers and he holds up a fire truck and he said this is where Lego started to go wrong 1997 you know it's not a terrible fire truck but it's not a great one he said then he holds up another fire truck these are his actual slides the the quality isn't very good because these this is the actual slide that he used um, he holds up this one this is the Jack Stone fire truck it was a couple of big chunky pieces that snapped together really quickly. And he said, there's so many problems with this. It looks nothing like a fire truck. These pieces cost a tremendous amount to make. Uh, we lost money hand over fist on this. Our traditional fans hated it. We will never build a fire truck like this again. And then he holds up a fire truck that he'd seen on somebody's desk. A guy named Eric Hansen had just developed this for, for the next year. And he said, this is a fire truck. This is who we are. You can see the studs, but it's modern, right? This is, and it's made from pieces that are used in lots of different sets. He said, we will never build a fire truck like the Jack Stone again. This is who we are. And this becomes a symbol within Lego. You know, different groups are asked, what is your fire truck? What's your, what's your return to the brick? Um, how can you design your toys using that limited palette of pieces? And, and they do. Um, another story. Ninjago. Ninjago was the hit toy from Lego in 2011. And I want to con contrast Ninjago with Galador. Um, Galador, as I told you, that was a toy that was brought out in 2002, and it had a TV show, and it had a, a video game. Um, the, the TV show, by the way, was so bad that I looked it up on IMDb, and nobody who acted in that TV show ever acted in anything ever again. <laughs> and the toy was... a, a, a complete disaster because people would see this Lego toy without very much Legoness to it. You know, you couldn't really assemble anything. You could take the arms off and put them back on, or I think you could put the arm in the hole where the head was, but it, it wasn't very Lego-y, and so people just stayed away from it. Um, and uh, similarly, the, the um, TV show and video game did horribly. But this, the way that Lego would make decisions back in this time period between 99 and 2002 was that the, the designers would come up with these toys and they'd have these big meetings where the, they'd, have, they'd display the toys and the management would walk through and say, yes, that's good, yes, that's good, no, no, and, and they would make decisions about what toys to bring out to market. Now contrast that with Ninjago. The way Ninjago worked was that they went out and they showed, they start with just pictures 
and they show these very evocative pictures to groups of seven-year-old boys. And they say, you know, just talk about this. And they, they have the saying that there's only two groups of honest people in the world, kids and drunks. Um, and kids will never lie about a, a toy, you know. And so they, they show it. And um, I watched some of these meetings. And if you show the kids uh, a, a picture, sometimes they just explode with energy. And they start talking about it and how fun it would be and what would happen in the story. And other times they just kind of, you know, yeah, fine. Um, you know, they, they, uh, they're not excited by it. And so they saw that the one on the left here um, w- with these ninjas really captured the kid's imagination. But then they had a challenge where the, if, if ninjas are the good guys, who are the bad guys? And so they, they came back and they said, well, is it you know, monkey people or lizards or, or space robots or, or something? And, and in a kid's uh, um, imagination, it was very clear. You know, lizard people, monkeys, robots, that didn't make any sense. Ninjas were real people. And so they would battle something like skeletons. You know, for, for them, the answer was completely clear, that skeletons must be the bad guys. And so they would come back and they'd say, okay, what kind of skeleton? And they'd show different... And so steadily, by changing the decision maker from somebody who looks like Eric Hansen in Bill in Denmark to a bunch of seven-year-olds in the U.S. and Germany and other countries, um, they learned that, you know, how you do the gates in the stage gate process is very important. <coughs> And, and they, I think, became more humble about their ability to predict whether a toy would be successful or not. And so by doing so, they, they um, uh, dramatically improved the success of the toy. Ninjago was a huge hit when it was brought out in 2011. Um, Bionicles. Um, Bionicles was a toy uh, brought out in 2001. And in many ways, it was the toy that saved Lego. Um, when Lego was near bankruptcy in 2003 and they looked around at the, the shattered wreckage of, of the uh, company, what they found was that what, what had really happened in 2003 um, is that they had had some great success with Lego Star Wars. Um, 1999 uh, was the first Lego Star Wars set. That was tremendously successful. Um, it, it came out with, uh, with the Star Wars movie, the Episode One, And then there was another movie in 2002 uh, another Star Wars movie and another set of toys. Those did tremendously well. They also did Lego Harry Potter. And there was Harry Potter movies in 2001 and 2002. There was no Star Wars or Harry Potter movie in 2003 or the first half of 2004. Sales of those toys uh, nosedived. Um, and so the only profitable toy they had left was Bionicle. And everything else was losing money. And so Bionicle really saved them. Um, Bionicle was incredibly popular. How many of you have kids that were Bionicle boys? Yeah. I mean, they sold 190 million of these, you know, more than the population of the UK, Germany, and Italy combined um, over the eight-year life of the toy. Uh, and kids that liked Bionicles really liked them. I mean, they, they would like to sleep in Bionicle sheets and wear Bionicle pajamas and wear Bionicle backpacks and, and you know, anything Bionicle they would happily do. There were, the most popular comic book in the world was the Bionicle comic books from DC Comics. The most popular young adult literature was the Bionicle books that came out from Scholastic. Um, and if kids read that, then they'd realize that the, the four Toa if, if you're going to battle the, the, um, the, the Rahi, then you need all four of the Toa. And that once you battle the Rahi and they unleash the Borok Swarm and the Krana um, attack the, the Bionicles and make them into Toa Nuva, then you need all four of the Toa Nuva, which are a completely different set of characters, if you're going to battle the Paraka. Um, and so they, they get very involved with the story. Um, and and uh, as, as the parent of Bionicle Boy myself, I can tell you are, are just uh, relentless in terms of getting all the different characters so they can act out all the dramas that, that are happening in the story. The problem was that all these other... Um, the problem and the opportunity was that all these other companies that made complementary products for Bionicle um, were, were having... They, they contributed a fair amount of revenue but they started to get a little bit annoyed with Lego. You know, they said, we're, we're having trouble kind of getting the information we want. What would happen is that Lego would spend a year um, developing the, the story and the characters, and then they'd spend a year in production kind of uh, um, making the toys and getting them ready for market, and then they'd be in the market for a year. What would happen is that by the time they'd finished developing the story and the characters, and then they'd tell their partners about, you know, this is going to be the story this year, and this is what's going to happen, 
Um, and then there'd be questions back and forth, and then proposals for products, and then uh, approval cycles. And by the time they finally brought it out to market, sometimes it would be halfway through the year. And they'd end up the year, um, you know, Bionicle characters will only last for one year. And so they'd end the year with uh, 50,000 pairs of unsold pajamas. And so they're getting unhappy with Lego. And so what Lego did is they, uh, they changed their development process. And they started putting in, and Eric talked some about this, um, started putting in um, some, some gates, some review points, where the teams had to have ready uh, the materials that the partners needed. You know, they redesigned the, um, the, the process around the needs of the partner. Um, and they also, they found that that almost worked. But another step that they did is they created something called the licensing group. And that licensing group was a group of people whose bonuses depended on the amount of external revenue from the partners of Lego. And when they had that group, whose job it was to kind of knock on the door of the Bionicles team and, and you know, say, Where, where's the material that, that our partners need, um, then the whole process began to work. Um, and what they put out was something called the style guide, which was basically everything a partner needed to know about Lego and, and um, the characters for this year and, and uh, the, the, the target audience and, and the stories and everything else so that they could make the right kind of uh, uh, complementary products. Another story, Mindstorms. And Eric, Eric told you a little bit about this. This is the robotics kit that Lego developed. Um, when it came time, the first round of the toy was brought out in 1998, as Eric mentioned. And the second toy, they started developing soon after their financial crisis in 2003, 2004. They pulled a team together and they said, we want to come out with the next round of this toy. And they, they, uh, they looked and they found a series of fans that were out there. Um, and it was fairly easy to find. They, they, um, there was forums and there was uh, events and, and these fans were fairly easy to identify. And what they did is, it, it's not really the wisdom of the crowd, but the wisdom of the clique, um, that they found four really expert um, Mindstorms b uh, builders. There's a couple who were really good at, at creating very complex creations. Uh, one that was very good at... Um, uh, uh, the sensors, the hardware. Another one that was very good at programming. Uh, somebody else was very good at using Lego in education. Um, and so they got four people, they invited them in uh, to, um, uh, to be part of the team. Um, those four, uh, they called them MUPs for Mindstorms user partners. Um, and they, uh, they, they, they quickly asked, the, the four asked, can we, you know, we've got some friends here, can they join too? And so it quickly grew from four to 11. Um, the four referred to the other ones as Muppets. Um, and, uh, and they steadily grew, uh, the, the, the group. And then in 2000, uh, January 2006, they took this robot um, to the com Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. And they said, we want 100 people that will help us develop the next generation of the toy, that will write articles, that will um, test out the toy, that will uh, come up with new creations, that will write books, and so forth. Um, expecting maybe they get a thousand people to apply for the privilege of paying retail price for the toy. Um, they get almost 10,000 people to apply. They sign up the best hundred of those, and they get to work. And what happens is that these people start flooding the, the small Mindstorms team with ideas. You know, we should do this, we should do that, we should ask these pieces, uh, add these pieces so we can build this creation. And, and um, you know, the, there's, they have a, a phrase, um, they say, if you didn't hire them, you can't fire them. You know, if, if I work for you and I come to you and I say, you know, we really should put these pieces in the box, and you say, well, we've got to hit this retail price, so, you know, we really can't add more than this, and so, no. You know, maybe I come back to you a second time, I probably don't come back a third time. These guys come back a hundred times. They never stop. And what happens is that the, the email boxes start to fill up, Lego starts not responding to them, and one of them, a guy named Steve Hassenplug, he pulls aside Soren Lund, the head of the Mindstorms team, and he said, look, you're either going to have a hundred happy people or a hundred unhappy people. Um, and right now, you're heading toward launch with a hundred unhappy people. And so, you know, what, what do you do? Well, what they did is they, they ended up uh, hiring a community organizer, a guy named Steve Canvin, um, and they said, you know, figure out how to work with the community. And over time, what they've done is they've created kind of a, a structure in the community where there's the Lego team in red, 
And then there's, there's different groups in the, in the Mindstorms community. There's the people that really um, like the software and the programming, the people that like the hardware, the sensors and the intelligent brick, and the people that like uh, figuring out how to use the software and the hardware to do amazing constructions. And so there's a, a key person in the community that can talk to a key person in the Lego team, but only that person. And then that person has his, and it is mostly men, his uh, lieutenants, and then th that person has their group that they work with, and then there's a whole set of people that are outside of the non-disclosure agreement. And so they, they really kind of set up a hierarchy in the community. And it was the idea of the community to not make this kind of a crowd, but rather a structured hierarchy. Um, but everybody was happier. Most of the questions get answered in the community. Um, and when LEGO needs an answer, they send it down to the person um, who would best be positioned to find the answer. They send it to one or two or three people that they know would, would be able to get an answer. And LEGO gets something back very quick. And so by putting some structure and thought around it, they've realized that you know, the, the, there's immense power in the community. Um, and it requires a, a different management style if you're going to leverage that power. Um, and uh, uh, Eric told you a little bit about the results. I mean, tremendous results. Uh, very successful toy, toy of the year, the wired cover story. Um, when they launched the toy, they turned over a lot of the PR opportunities to their fans. They said they're, they're much more knowledgeable, believable, passionate about our toy than we are. And so they actually had the fans uh, do, the, do a lot of the press. Um, that one of the members of the team, a guy named Paul Smith Meyer, um, he went on to work with this guy, Adam Reed Tucker, to create the Lego architecture line. And what's interesting about it is, is that they're almost doing the same type of expansion of the community with Lego architecture. That just as they started with four MUPS for, the, for Lego Mindstorms, and then they went to 11, then they went to 100. Well, with, with architecture, they started with just Adam Reed Tucker, but then as they went into, um, you know, they started doing some of the European landmarks, they brought in some other architects, you know, to do um, uh, Big Ben and to do the Villa Savoy in France. Um, and so they're steadily expanding the group of people. Um, but this is a huge uh, step for Lego. I don't think Eric uh, emphasized this, but think about it. Lego is moving from the creator, the designer of toys, to a publisher of toys. That's a very different business model, and they're dis distributed through a very different channel. And then uh, um, another thing that they did as they started to think about different types of innovation um, is to use this innovation matrix. And the horizontal uh, categories, the, the columns here, are different types of innovation. And the vertical dimension is how innovative something is. So at the bottom is something that's kind of incremental that Lego's done before, you know, the next fire station, the next police car, something like that. Whereas at the top is the really never seen before type of innovation. And what they do is whenever a team is coming out with a major new product, they challenge that team to think about what are the other complementary innovations that will make us more successful. So, for example, when Mindstorms came out, they, you know, it was a toy that they'd done um, before. It was a major challenge, but not a big challenge. Um, they were going to make the sensors and, and new sensors and intelligent brick. Um, they'd sell it the same way and make it the same way. Um, uh, they were also going to launch it as an educational program. But the big change was how they worked with the community. And so think about this as a tool that you might use. Right? That, that by challenging your teams to think about not just what is the core innovation or core product, but also what are the complementary ones. And by mapping this out, you get a much better idea of where the risks are, where you have to invest, who should be involved in reviewing it, and what results you'll see. Lego doesn't just hope that they'll get lots of innovations that complement each other. They demand it of their teams to tell them how that will happen. Um, they also reorganized the company. I won't talk about this much. I did a little piece in Harvard Business Review so that every organization was responsible for a quadrant in this matrix. Um, and then CUSO we already talked about with Eric. And so I'll close by just kind of um, the, the best way to explain what happened with Lego uh, is, uh, is the, actually the, um, the Darwin Award winner from 1995. Um, Darwin Awards are given to people that 
die in such spectacularly stupid ways that they unwittingly prove Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, they enrich our gene pool by removing themselves from it. You know, it's, it's kind of, instead of uh, survival of the fittest, it's the extinction of the stupidest. Um, and the, I, I think the 1995 Darwin Award winner is a good metaphor for Lego. Because what he did is he strapped a, a, a jet engine to the back of a Chevy Impala he went out to the Arizona desert, accelerated up to highway speed, lit off the jet engine, the car takes off down the road. A couple miles down the road, there's skid marks where he tries to put on the brakes, but the car goes airborne. He's flying through the air, and then there's a turn. And they find halfway up um, a three-foot-deep impact crater and just small pieces of, of Chevy Impala and jet engines scattered around. And so I said to the CEO of Lego, I said, that was you. You know, the problem is, is not that these, these truths about innovation don't work. The problem is that they do. And you accelerated your innovation beyond anything that you could control. And you were like that car heading toward that cliff. And, and to take the, the analogy one step further, you know, they, they had no ability to control the car, to guide the car. You know, you can kind of picture somebody, you, you know, with a steering wheel and, and, a, and a gas pedal or brake pedal flying through the air, you know, kind of desperately trying to put on the brake and nothing happening. That was kind of Lego in 2002. Um, but what they really did is, is you know, w with an airplane, you have a set of ailerons and struts and flaps and rudders and, and all the, the knobs and dials and sticks and switches to, uh, to control them. Um, and so what they did is kind of they strapped on uh, the wings and learned to fly the plane, just barely missing that cliff. And, and now they're like a plane flying at 30,000 feet um, while Mattel and Hasbro and their other competitors are, you know, kind of driving nicely down the road, but nowhere near uh, Lego's level of performance. And, and so um, to take the analogy just one step further, um, an airplane's guidance system has three parts. The first is direction. Where, where do you want to go? Um, and then there's positioning, you know, where are you? It's like a GPS, right? But airplanes, GPS are much more sophisticated. And then controls, the ailerons and struts and flaps and rudders and all the switches and dots and knobs to control them. Um, and so, you know, Lego uh, basically implemented the same thing in their company to manage innovation. That an innovation guidance system is all about, you know, having a clear direction about where you want to go as a company. They lost that direction in 2000 and they started creating all kinds of toys that weren't really very Lego-y. Um, and they lost control of, um, of everything that was happening. And what we saw here, what I tried to show you, was just some of all the different things that they did, the new roles that they started. There's something called the design lab that, that tracks the number of elements that they have and keeps it from getting out of control again. They changed the development process and brought kids into the center of it. Um, they, they, changed, uh, they, they changed everything about how they work with partners and created all kinds of tools like the innovation matrix and the, um, um, uh, and the, the style guide. Um, they changed the organization, they changed the reward system, um, all kinds of roles throughout the company to give not just the space to create, but the direction to deliver. And by doing so, they've um, uh, resulted in that 24% that, uh, annual sales and 40% annual uh, profit growth. So with that, uh, um, thank you, and uh, I think we'll move it over to Q&A.